I'm Dr. Katherine Haas. This is a lesson to introduce you to the concept of reaction stoichiometry. As part of this lesson, you will need to practice using a pencil and paper, so please have some writing materials ready. Before you can understand the concepts of reaction stoichiometry, you will need to understand the conventions for expressing chemical reactions. In other words, you must be able to write and interpret chemical equations, like the one shown here, and you will also need to be able to balance chemical equations. Additionally, you will need to use dimensional analysis to convert units. If you have not mastered these skills yet, please go back to the previous lessons on these topics before proceeding here. Throughout this lesson on stoichiometry, I will assume that you've already mastered these skills. In chemistry, stoichiometry is the numerical relationship between the amounts of chemical species in a balanced chemical equation. In other words, it is the relationship that is implied by the numerical coefficients that are used to balance the equation. The equation must be balanced correctly in order to determine stoichiometric relationships. For example, the stoichiometric relationship between glucose and carbon dioxide in this equation is 1 mole of glucose to 6 moles of carbon dioxide. Stoichiometric relationships can be useful for predicting the amounts of product that should form from some given amount of reactant and vice versa. Stoichiometry can be applied to find the amount of reactant we would need to make a given amount of product. The stoichiometric relationships in a chemical equation are analogous to the relationships between amounts of ingredients in cooking. Let's use a simple example of cooking a grilled cheese sandwich to illustrate how we can use the stoichiometric relationships. We will use the recipe of two slices of bread and one slice of cheese to make one grilled cheese sandwich. We can write this recipe in the same form as a chemical equation. To balance the equation, we need the coefficient 2 in front of bread and the coefficient 1 for cheese and for sandwich. The coefficient 1 is usually not written explicitly. The balanced equation reveals the stoichiometric relationships between bread, cheese, and sandwiches. For example, the relationship between bread and sandwich is two slices of bread to two one sandwich. Now you try. Please write down the stoichiometric relationships between cheese slices and sandwiches, and then also for bread and cheese slices. I'll stop speaking for a moment so that you can pause and take time to think about this. The relationship between cheese and sandwich is one cheese slice to one sandwich. We determine this from the balanced equation, where the coefficient for both cheese slice and sandwich are one. Remember that we don't usually write the coefficient one, but it is implied. The relationship between bread and cheese is two bread slices to one cheese slice. Again, we determine this from the balanced equation where the coefficient for bread is two and that for cheese is one. Now that we have these stoichiometric relationships written out in front of us, it's a convenient time to point out that the stoichiometric relationships can each be treated as equivalencies and used as a conversion factor for dimensional analysis. Let's practice writing the conversion factors now. Each one of the stoichiometric relationships would have two possible ways that we can write the conversion factor. I'll sh do the first one for you and then I'll let you do the next two on your own. For two bread slices to one sandwich, we can write it either as two bread slices over one sandwich or one sandwich over two bread slices. Which one of these we use will depend on the rest of our dimensional analysis problem, and we'll see that in a moment. For now, please write the conversion factors for cheese and sandwiches and bread and cheese. I'll stop speaking now so that you can pause the video and try this on your own. Now that we recognize stoichiometric relationships between bread, cheese, and sandwiches, let's see how these relationships can be applied as unit conversion factors. Let's walk through the steps to answer this question. How many sandwiches can be made from 10 slices of bread? This is really a unit conversion problem between units, the units of bread and of sandwich. The conceptual strategy is to convert units of bread slices to units of sandwiches. Our conversion factor between bread and sandwich is the stoichiometric relationship between the two of them. To solve this problem, 
we use the bread to sandwich relationship as a conversion factor, and we write the conversion factor as a fraction so that the units cancel appropriately. This leaves us with the answer to the question, five sandwiches could be made from 10 slices of bread. Now you try. Practice what you just learned, but by answering this question, how many slices of bread are needed to make 15 sandwiches? Even though you might be able to solve this without writing anything, please practice writing out the solution using dimensional analysis. I will stop talking for a moment so that you can press the pause button and practice. Do this now. This time we are starting with the unit of 15 sandwiches and our goal unit is slices of bread. To do this conversion, we will need the same conversion factor that we used the last time, the stoichiometric relationship between bread slices and sandwich, which is two bread slices to one sandwich. We write 15 sandwiches, our starting quantity and unit, use the conversion factor so that the unit sandwiches cancel, and we are left with our goal unit bread slices. The calculation tells us that we need 30 bread slices to make 15 sandwiches. Now that we've seen how stoichiometric relationships apply to cooking recipes, let's apply the same concepts to calculate quantities in a chemical reaction. For stoichiometric relationships in a chemical reaction, we are working in units of molecules and atoms, or more commonly, moles of molecules and atoms. The reaction for the metabolism of glucose is shown here. One mole of glucose, which has the formula C6H12O6, will react with six moles of dioxygen to give six moles of carbon dioxide and six moles of water. This reaction is taking place in your body all the time. It's the way that cells get energy. An average person at rest must consume approximately 24.6 moles of dioxygen per day to make enough energy for life. The question asks, how many moles of glucose are consumed each day? And the equation is already balanced. Let's do this one together. The first step after balancing an equation is to plan the strategy of uh, addressing the question. This question is asking us to convert from units of moles of dioxygen to moles of glucose. To make this conversion, we need the stoichiometric relationship between moles of dioxygen and moles of glucose. The balanced equation tells us that it is six moles of dioxygen to one mole of glucose. Now that we have a strategy, we can make the conversion using dimensional analysis. We start with 24.6 moles of dioxygen and use the unit conversion factor so that moles of dioxygen cancel and we're left with moles of glucose as our final unit. The calculation then tells us our answer is 4.10 moles of glucose. Now you try. Begin to plan the strategy for this next question, then find the solution. Please write out your solution using dimensional analysis and take as much time as you need to think and practice. I will stop talking for a moment so that you can press the pause button. Do this now. The strategy here is to convert between units of moles of dioxygen to units of moles of carbon dioxide. We can perform this conversion with just one conversion factor, the stoichiometric relationship of six moles of dioxygen to six moles of carbon dioxide. When we start with 24.6 moles of dioxygen and use the six to six ratio as a conversion factor, we find that 24.6 moles of carbon dioxide are produced. We just practiced mole to mole conversion using stoichiometry, but most applications of stoichiometry also require us to use units of mass or volume, since in real life, we measure most quantities in units of mass or volume. This makes stoichiometry calculations and the strategy involved only slightly more complex. Here I'll show you how to use a slightly more complex strategy to perform mass to mass conversions using stoichiometry. We'll use the same question that we just saw, except the quantities are going to be given in grams and you are asked to find the solution in units of grams. As before, we've got to start with the balanced equation and then we plan our strategy. This question is ultimately asking us to convert between grams of dioxygen and grams of glucose, but there is no direct conversion between these two units. 
what we do have using stoichiometry is a conversion factor between moles of glucose and moles of dioxygen. And recall that you can convert from grams to moles of any molecule using its molar mass. Therefore, we can perform this conversion using several steps. First, we will convert from grams of dioxygen to moles of dioxygen using the molecular mass of dioxygen. Then we can convert from moles of dioxygen to moles of glucose using the stoichiometric relationship, and then from moles of glucose to grams of glucose using the molar mass of glucose. Take a moment now to calculate the molecular masses, or the molar masses, of dioxygen and glucose using their molecular formulas. Then try writing out the solution to this problem using dimensional analysis and see how far you can get towards the answer. Remember, you can always rewind the video if you'd like to see the strategy again. I'll stop talking for a moment. Please press the pause button so that you have time to think and write out the solution. The molecular mass of dioxygen is 32.0 grams in one mole. And the mass for glucose is 180.18 grams in one mole. It's okay if you rounded to a different digit than I did. Now that we have strategy and we've gathered our conversion factors, we can convert from grams of dioxygen to grams of glucose. We start with 786 grams of dioxygen and convert to moles of dioxygen, then to moles of glucose and grams of glucose, making sure to care carefully write each conversion factor so that units cancel and we're left only with grams of glucose as the final unit. The correct value is 738 grams of glucose. The strategy we just used can be generalized for getting from the mass unit of one chemical species to the mass unit of another. For any reaction where A is one species and B is another, we can convert from the mass of A to the mass of B by going through the mole unit. The conversion from mass in grams to mole is the molar mass of that substance, and the conversion from moles of A to moles of B is their stoichiometric relationship. Now it's your turn to apply the strategy and skills you just learned to answer this question. How many grams of water are produced each day? Again, we're assuming that the person is consuming 786 grams of oxygen each day. I will pause the lesson for one minute, but it will take you longer than that to think through and write out your answer. So in a moment, you should press the pause button. Practice your skills by writing out your answer using dimensional analysis, and remember that you can rewind the video if you need to review anything. Press the pause button now and try to solve this question on your own. Now I will talk over the steps to answering this question. Press the pause button if you're not ready yet. The starting unit is grams of dioxygen, and the goal unit is grams of water. We can convert between moles and grams of dioxygen using its molar mass, and between moles and grams of water using its molar mass. We found the molar mass of dioxygen in the previous example, and the molar mass of water can be found from its molecular formula. It is 18.02 grams per mole. The conversion between moles of dioxygen and moles of water is the stoichiometric relationship within the chemical equation. That is six moles of dioxygen and six moles of water. With this strategy, we can begin to write out the solution using dimensional analysis. 786 grams of dioxygen can be converted to moles of dioxygen using the molar mass. Moles of dioxygen is converted to moles of water using the stoichiometric relationship, and moles of water is converted to grams of water using the molar mass of water. This leaves us with the goal unit in grams of water, and the calculation gives us 443 grams of water. Now you know how to convert using stoichiometric relationships. Let's return to our cooking analogy to illustrate a few more concepts that relate to stoichiometry. We will use the grilled cheese sandwich analogy to illustrate limiting reactant, theoretical yield, and actual yield. Let's start by addressing this question. How many sandwiches can we make if we start with four slices of bread and four slices of cheese? This is a common type of question you might encounter. 
You might have a certain amount of each reagent and you must determine how much product you can get. So let's see. You can use stoichiometric unit conversions to determine how much product, in this case sandwiches, could be made from each reactant. In the case of cheese, we can use the stoichiometric relationship of one cheese slice to one sandwich to convert four cheese slices to four sandwiches. This means as long as we had enough of the other ingredients, we could make four sandwiches from four slices of cheese. In the case of bread, if we use a similar strategy, we find that we can only make two sandwiches from the bread, as long as we had enough of the other ingredients. Here we have a case where we are limited by one of the reactants, the bread. We can't make four sandwiches from the cheese because we really only have enough bread to make two sandwiches. The bread is limiting the number of sandwiches we can make. In other words, the bread is the reactant that limits the amount of product that can form. The limiting reactant is the reactant that limits the amount of product. All of the other reagents are in excess. So we could say in this case that the cheese is the reactant in excess. The amount of product that can theoretically form from this situation is the maximum amount from the limiting reactant. So in this case, because bread is our limiting reactant, our theoretical yield is two sandwiches. In a real situation, we almost never get the maximum amount possible from the limiting reagent. In other words, it is rare to get the exact amount predicted by the theori theoretical yield. The actual yield is usually less and sometimes much less. For example, let's say that when we tried to make the grilled cheese sandwiches, one of them was burnt badly to the point it was not edible. This would leave us with only one sandwich as our actual yield. The actual yield is the amount of product that is actually produced. There's just one last concept, the comparison of the actual yield to the theoretical yield. We compare these two values using percent yield. The percent yield is the percent of the theoretical amount that we actually get. In mathematical terms, it is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield multiplied by 100%. Let's find the percent yield for this grilled cheese analogy. In this case, the percent yield of sandwiches would be found by dividing one sandwich, the actual yield, by two sandwiches, the theoretical yield, and multiplying by 100%. This gives us a 50% yield. Now let's try this with a practical example in a chemical context. Shown here is a chemical reaction. The structures are shown in a form called skeletal structures. It's not important that you understand what the structures mean and the chemical formulas are shown below them. This is a reaction used to synthesize aspirin also known as acetosalicylic acid. Let's imagine a chemist is tasked with synthesizing some aspirin. She has 45 grams of salicylic acid, one of the starting materials, and 30 grams of acetic anhydride, the other starting material. Find the limiting reagent and the theoretical yield. And if the actual yield is 33.7 grams, what is the percent yield? In a moment, I'll ask you to pause the video and try, the, try to solve this. But first, let's review how we can approach a problem like this based on what we saw in our cooking analogy. If you need to identify a limiting reactant and a theoretical yield, you first need to calculate how much product is possible from each of the amounts of reactant. This means that you will do unit conversions just as we have done several times now. For this problem, you'll need the stoichiometric relationships for mole to mole conversions, and you'll need the molar masses to make gram to mole conversions. After you calculate how much product is possible from each reactant, you'll identify the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield from that reactant. The limiting reactant is the one that produces the least amount of product. Then. If you also know the actual yield, you can calculate the percent yield. Okay, pause the video now and give this a try. To solve this problem, we'll need a balanced chemical equation and the molar masses for each of the reactants and 
the aspirin product. I've given the molar masses here in colored boxes, and the equation is actually already balanced. All right, let's talk through this together. First, we'll find the possible yield from the first reagent, or the first reactant, salicylic acid. We start with the unit of grams of salicylic acid, and our goal unit is grams of aspirin. We can convert from grams of salicylic acid to moles of salicylic acid using its molecular mass or molar mass. And you can calculate this from the formula of salicylic acid that was given. You can also convert between moles and grams of aspirin using its molecular uh, mass. And again, you can calculate this from the formula that was given in the problem. And then you can calculate between moles of salicylic acid and moles of aspirin using the stoichiometric relationship between salicylic acid and aspirin is one mole of salicylic acid to one mole of aspirin. Now that we have a strategy and all of our unit conversions, we can start writing the dimensional analysis. We start with 45 grams of salicylic acid and we convert to moles of salicylic acid using the molar mass of salicylic acid. Then we convert from moles of salicylic acid to moles of aspirin using the stoichiometric relationship. And then we can convert to grams of aspirin using the molar mass of aspirin. Now we've arrived at our goal unit and the calculation tells us that we can make 58.7 grams of aspirin from 45 grams of salicylic acid. To find the possible yield from acetic anhydride, we use a similar strategy. Our starting unit is grams of acetic anhydride, and our goal unit is grams of aspirin. We can convert between grams of acetic anhydride and moles using the molar mass of acetic anhydride, again calculated from the formula. Conversion between moles of aspirin and grams of aspirin can be done with, again, the molar mass of aspirin and the conversion between moles of acetic anhydride and moles of aspirin is the stoichiometric relationship between the two, which in this case is one mole of acetic anhydride to one mole of aspirin. That's our strategy, and now we can start writing the dimensional analysis. We start with 30 grams of acetic anhydride, and we convert to moles of acetic anhydride using its molar mass. Then we convert to moles of aspirin using the stoichiometric relationship. And then we convert to grams of aspirin using its molar mass. Now we've arrived at our goal unit and we can start plugging numbers into our calculator. And now we have 52.9 grams of aspirin is the possible yield from the acetic anhydride. Okay, so now we can compare these two values. The limiting reagent is the one that will limit us. It's the one that will produce the least amount of product. In this case, it's the acetic anhydride. This is our limiting reactant, and the theoretical yield is 52.9 grams of aspirin. Now we can calculate the percent yield using the theoretical yield and the actual yield that it was given in the problem. Percent yield is going to be the actual yield, 33.7 grams of aspirin, divided by the theoretical yield, 52.9 grams of aspirin, times 100%. This gives us a value of 63.7% yield. This is the end of the lesson on stoichiometry and stoichiometric relationships. Thanks for watching this video. Now it's up to you to practice what you've just learned.